I'm sorry, he's easily confused. Um, I'm supposed to do questions and answers now, which I'll be happy to do. It's what, in Virginia Woolf, they, sorry? Oh, you can't hear. Okay, yes, please bring up the lights. I need to see my accusers. This is, this is the portion that in Virginia Woolf they used to refer to as get the guest. There are, mic there are three microphones, I'm told, around the back there if you'd like to go and do that. Thank you, Dr. Crichton. That was extremely interesting, and I totally agree with the basic point that we should not be so simplistic and assume that we know everything. Can I ask you about two particular possible threats in the near future that you, I'm certain, are available, aware of? One is the overuse of antibiotics that has created a problem with resistant bacteria, and the other is the very recent uh, tremendous scientific advance of recreating the DNA of the 1918 flu virus, which of course many people compare to your book Jurassic Park. And then of course what they did was they published it, making it available to anyone and everyone. And a number of people have said this was a little too much. They could have kept it a little bit more secret than just putting it on the public airwaves. So what do you think of either of those two problems? What are your opinions on either of those? Are they real problems? What should we do? What should we have done, et cetera? The, um, the overuse of antibiotics or in some cases, the, the partial use and underuse, because the uh, highly resistant strains of tuberculosis, many of, uh, many of those have come out of Russian prisons where, where um, inmates were inadequately treated and the, the strains became more virulent. Um, it's a huge problem. I mean, when I was, a, when I was in medical school back in the Stone Age, um, we used to talk about whether or not we would give uh, sterile saline injections to kids when the mothers insisted that an antibiotic be given. Um, it's real hard, you know. It's it's a it's a difficult problem, and I don't I don't know that there's a there's a satisfactory solution. Um, I know myself if I've had a cold for long enough and I feel bad enough and I go to my doctor and he says it's just a virus, there's a part of me that wants to say, well, give me the antibiotic anyway. And I certainly know better. In terms of the 1918 flu publication, whether or not you publish it is a very, uh, is a very difficult matter. Um, and a similar sort of uh, problem arose when um, uh, when a mouse virus was uh, made extremely virulent by an Australian team by accident in, I think, 2000, and they published that as well. The, one of the, or one, I suppose, one, I, I tend to favor openness in all things, you know, and, and I think one of the problems with not publishing it is that most of the time all uh, a team needs to know is that it's possible to do something. And, and that enormously increases the, ch the chance that somebody will succeed in doing it. So one, if word is going to get out that the thing has been recreated. And, and so from that standpoint, I'm less concerned about publication. But it's, it's a terrible problem. I don't know. I don't have good answers. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Crichton, one of your books that had a tremendous influence on me and, it, in fact, kind of inspired me to uh, go to the uh, Peace Corps was Travels. It's a book that I recommended to other friends and they enjoyed it as well. And it's been a few years since that book's been published and I wanted to know if you're ever going to do a follow-up uh, book to Travels. Yes, I am. Um, I've been intending to do it for a long time and, and somehow, I don't know, it's, it's some mysterious process that the book is now 18 years old, so. I've had enough, uh, enough life experiences in that time, not all of them pleasant, but um, I've had enough that I think I can certainly do another book. Thank you. Thank you for a very stimulating talk. I seem to recall from a, a talk you gave several years ago in California, uh, before State of Fear was published, uh, you were saying that uh, global warming may be a reality uh, if it is a reality, it's too late to do much about it. I hope I'm not deforming your thoughts. And in any case, 
uh, it would be, as I say, remedial actions would be too late now, man-made in, in remedial actions. So I wondered if you, if you still, if, that, if I'm conveying your thoughts before, from before the book accurately, and if that's true, that you think that global warming may be something that can, that could be addressed by man successfully or unsuccessfully, how you feel about nuclear, more nuclear energy in this country as a measure that to be taken or not? As you were speaking, I was trying to remember what that was the talk called Aliens Cause Global Warming at Caltech. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it was at Caltech, but it was the idea was that indeed that um, the global warming had become something that showed how irrational uh, our responses, our analysis and, and plans for response have become. But I remember the phrase even if even if it is a reality, it's too late for nuclear energy or any other remedial action to be successful in in, re in reversing the course of events. Yeah, I, uh, I I don't recall what I said. I would be surprised if I said that because I don't agree with that. Um, I think that um, what I believe is is more in line with what I said today, which is that we're we're in a long-term trend of moving away from fossil fuels and um, and I would expect that trend to continue the, you know it's very odd to me that in if if you compare the world in 1900 to the year to the world in 2000 and then imagine that we are now looking toward the year 2100 in the same way in 1900 there are almost no cars and there are no airplanes now we have at any moment something like 10,000 airplanes in the air and, and we're so sick and tired of cars that we're trying to get rid of them, that, um, except for teenage boys. And the, the notion that we will continue to have cars and airplanes 100 years from now strikes me as really odd. You know, we didn't have them 100 years ago and, the, and I can't imagine that it will continue to be a problem a century from now. But in the meantime, um, I, I think it is well worth re-examining um, our decisions on nuclear energy. Um, I know there's a, there's a waste disposal problem. I also think that we, um, you know, I hate to say, I hate to advocate anything from France, but France does get 80% of its electrical power from nuclear. They made that decision a long time ago, and they do that. Um, if if you're really, to the extent that you're concerned about global warming, and, and as you can tell, I'm, I'm not very concerned, but I think there are many more pressing problems and we should be spending our money elsewhere, but to the extent that you're concerned with global warming, I would think that you would be urging as many nuclear reactors to be built as possible. Was there another part of the question? Or, no? I'm kind of curious about your thoughts, you know, and obvious parallel would be, you know, to me, in terms of fear, um, the current moral panic over terrorism, our government responding to this, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, specifically regarding um, how do you get a population past the fear, which I think in many ways relates to, at least in this culture, that many people don't have a very good uh, scientific literacy, and so they, they have problems looking not just at something like global warming and the environmental issues, but also, you know, when the government puts out these concerns over other issues that people feel are, oh, that's so complex, I can't understand that. So I was just wondering about some of your thoughts in that regard. Um, I can't really say anything good about politics, um, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I have a very weird um, answer to this question, which is that um, when I was when I was an undergraduate, I was on the student newspaper at Harvard, and um, and everybody was a, was a news hound in those days. We were all phenomenally interested in the news, and the, and the head of the paper was a guy named Jay Featherstone, and he decided for a year not to read any newspaper. And so, of course, it was a, you know an incredible uh, sort of test, and we went to him as if he was undergoing radiation treatment or something. And we said, "Well, Jay, how is it?" You know, and he said, "Actually, it's pretty nice." <laughs> You know, you you, uh, you you hear everything that you need to know from other people, and you uh, save a lot of time, and you don't you know you don't get unnecessarily provoked. Um, my own view, actually, is the EPA has fallen down, and I mean, I think there are reasons to believe that that provoking low-grade uh, fear levels is deleterious to human health. I mean, I touched on that in the talk, and I. 
I actually believe that if the EPA was really paying attention, they would be trying to limit exposure to television as a toxic uh, exposure. But you don't have to wait for that. You can just turn it off. And, you know, play some, play, you know, play some Bach. It's really uh, Goldberg variations, very delightful, and settle yourself down. I'm not being facetious, by the way. I think to unplug from the media is actually a useful thing to do from time to time. First of all, I wanted to thank you for all your um, entertaining thrillers that I've enjoyed over the years. Has there ever been a topic that you have thought was too controversial and therefore you chose not to write about it? Yes. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I'll give you five dollars. <laughs>